Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Sir at the League of Municipalities. Uh, thanking you for, for joining us uh, for our, today's Lunch and Learn uh, with the New Jersey Age-Friendly Advisory Council. Uh, slated to speak to us today is uh, Stacy Callahan, who is the uh, Senior Researcher for the New Jersey Department of Human Services, Office of Research and, uh, Research and Evaluation uh, here in Trenton been with DHS since 2017. Uh, Jersey, from beginning to end here, it looks like, uh, Kane University, Rutgers University, uh, grew up in Somerset and Hunterdon counties, living in Gloucester, Burlington now. Uh, so Stacy, thank you for, for working with us and putting us together. Uh, joining here will be uh, Melissa Chalker, who is the Deputy Director of the Division of Aging Services with the Department of Human Services. Uh, Melissa joined state government in 2021. Previously, she was the executive director of the New Jersey Advocates for Aging Well, which uh, had also been formerly known as the New Jersey Foundation for Aging. And um, our third speaker will be Janet Sharma, who is the coordinator of Age Friendly, of the Age Friendly Englewood Initiative, uh, which was launched in 2016 to help the community become more livable for people of all ages. Uh, particularly the growing number of older adults. Uh, previously, she had served 22 years as executive director of the Volunteer Center of Bergen County and chaired the Bergen County Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster uh, following uh, Hurricane Sandy. So we have um, three excellent speakers I'm gonna uh, speak to today on, on uh, age-friendly communities and as well. So uh, I, will, I will launch the... PowerPoint and share the screen in a moment. And then I will hand it to, I believe, Stacy, you're up next, you're up first. I think I'm actually going to divert to Melissa. I think Melissa's going to right. start kick it off for us. All right, um, Melissa. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. It took me a minute to find my unmute button. You think I'd be an expert at Zoom by now after all this time, right? Um, anyway, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you for offering us an opportunity to share um, with you some information about New Jersey's Age Friendly Initiative. Um, if you're asking yourself, what is age friendly? Don't worry, Janet is going to explain everything in a few minutes. Um, but simply put, um, age-friendly efforts create places where people can grow up and grow older in a thriving environment together. Uh, and the state of New Jersey is dedicated to expanding these age-friendly practices across our state, um, as evidenced by uh, Governor Murphy's signing uh, Executive Order 227, which established uh, in March of 2021, which established the New Jersey Age-Friendly State Advisory Council. The executive order also directs the Department of Human Services with the advice of the council to develop a blueprint for advancing age friendly practices across the state. The advisory council consists of 20 plus members uh, from various backgrounds, including state government, transportation, housing, health care, uh, and the business community. We've been meeting with that council monthly since March of 2022, and we're making great progress in gathering information that will inform our blueprint on how to make New Jersey a more age-friendly state. Uh, in fact, uh, as part of that process, we've been holding public listening sessions, uh, one of which we'll be holding this evening from 5 to 7, which will be viewable on the DHS YouTube page. Uh, and we did uh, previously hold a session last week on March 14th, um, which is also available in recording in that same place. Uh, and we're very excited to um, be doing this work in order to, as we've said, to advance uh, age-friendly practices across the state. And so to tell us a little bit more about that, Janet is going to explain to us just what is age-friendly. So Janet, I'm going to throw it to you. Sure. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, Melissa just did that, and I think Melissa has done that. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, how can your community benefit from becoming age-friendly? I think um, you can go to the next slide, that's fine. Uh, I think for most of the organizations, most of the communities that are age-friendly uses the framework, AARP's eight domains of livability. These were formed, I think, back in 2002 when the World Health Organization and AARP did studies of about 22 cities around the country, around the world, to find out how could people 
age in place? What were the things that they would need to have that community be livable? And the main important things were, which will sound very familiar to all of you, housing, outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, communications and information, civic participation and employment, respect and social inclusion, health services and community supports, that's knowing about all the resources available, and social participation. So that's what we used in our framework. Next slide, please. And why age-friendly? Well, that's because America is aging. Um, in 2015, you can see the number of people that were older than, uh, than well, what is it? I'm not sure what those statistics are. Anyway, that's the point of it is to show how the aging is, must be the percentage of people who are getting really old in, in the US. And you can see it's changing dramatically. Uh, next slide, please. And studies also show that eight of 10 adults want to stay where they live. They want to stay in their community and they want to stay in their own home as long as possible. And that poses a challenge because people are living longer a lot of them are living healthier, but a lot of them are gonna be in a slow decline for a lot longer period of time. Next slide, please. There are uh, 732 age-friendly communities, nine states and one territory enrolled so far. That was as of January 31st this year. There are 21 age-friendly communities in New Jersey at this point, and AARP does have a process you can go through to become designated as an age-friendly community, whether it's a, a community, a county, or a state. Uh, next slide, please. I'm mostly familiar with Bergen County because that's where I live and work. And in Bergen County, there are six age-friendly communities. Fair Lawn for All Ages, which is a relatively new one. And then the other five were all started around the same time. Age-friendly Englewood, age-friendly Ridgewood, age-friendly Teaneck, Westwood for all ages and generations for Garfield. We can all choose the, the name that we want and use our own branding however we want. Um, next slide, please. We all typically follow the same timeline. Um, in 2016, the Henry and Marilyn Chaub Foundation put out an RFP for communities to form coalitions that would help older adults age in place. And we all went about this essentially in the same way by forming a coalition that was a public-private partnership where we worked with the leadership of the community, the elected officials and the town administrators, but also with the local nonprofits, with the local healthcare agencies or hospitals, certainly with the Department of Health and other departments within city government, but it really was a public-private partnership. And there was somebody at the helm who was guiding this work. I was the one in Englewood, in Garfield, it was the woman who was the director of the public health department. And in other communities, it was a leader of a nonprofit organization. As I had said, it, as, uh, as Mike said in my introduction, I was the CEO of the Volunteer Center of Bergen County for many years. So I already knew a lot about the community and about Englewood in particular. Um, the Todd Foundation gave grants of $75,000, or I think it was $25,000 for planning to Englewood, Garfield, Ridgewood, Teaneck, and Westwood. And then after that, as long as we kept moving forward, we got about $75,000 a year for five years, which was then extended because of the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. We all went through pretty much the same process once we got a planning grant. We assessed the older adults and services in our communities. What do they think they'll need as they age? and what is already available. And then we, uh, we gathered and analyzed and interpreted the data through surveys and focus groups and interviews. And we identified needs and gaps in services in the community, or a lot of them had to do with county services as well. And then we implemented the plan to meet the needs. We developed goals, strategies, deliverables, and metrics. Um, and then we had ongoing assessment, which we reported to the Todd Foundation. And also we really interacted a lot with each other to determine where we were on our planning and on our and on our um, actually meeting our deliverables. And then we did evaluation and we kept doing it over and over again, uh, just seeing how things work. And if they didn't work, we'd try something else in the same way you do with a lot of initiatives in town. Next slide, please. Now we'll get to Age-Friendly Englewood and some of this will become more clear to you. Age-Friendly Englewood is a community-wide project that is working to ensure that residents of Englewood can age in place in their homes and in the community with dignity and independence. 
Age-Friendly Englewood seeks to help the community become more livable for people of all ages, with particular attention to the rapidly growing number of older adults. An age-friendly community is a great place to grow up and grow old. That's our mantra. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, that the, the, what we did at the very in initial phase was to form a community collaboration. This is a diagram that I like from uh, Garfield. The one, the Englewood is just the list of organizations. It's about 60 organizations that are involved in our coalition. Garfield shows you, you should see the wide range of organizations that are involved in their, in their coalition as community partners. And that's really what makes it work is when you bring in, you cast a very broad net to bring in as many providers as possible. The, the ones who deal with older adults in the community and the people who know the most about the community, the people who serve the community, through the city cult, through the city government, and uh, just a wide range of, of, of organizations. In Englewood also, um, some of the houses of worship are very active. So we brought in the Orthodox Jewish communities and the Black churches, and some of them are very active, also several of the other Protestant churches. And they, they all played a real big role in uh, getting things going. Next slide, please. Um, the needs that we identified in Englewood through our surveying and focus groups were that we needed, and this was probably very familiar in your community as well, more and more affordable housing options, affordable transportation options that will get people where they need to go when they want to go there, better pedestrian safety with sidewalks, crossings, and benches. Um, pedestrian safety is an issue all across the state. We're the most densely populated state, and there's a big problem with pedestrian safety. People also needed information about services. Of course, you could go to any of the websites of all those organizations and find out what they offer. But how in the world, if you don't use a computer, which many older adults don't, uh, how are you going to access that information? So we wanted to try to make information more accessible so people would know what's available in the community. And then we wanted to reach out and identify those who are already isolated. Um, and then an overarching thing in Englewood especially was residents want to come together across the boundaries of geography, race, religion, and age. Um, there's a big divide in Englewood, which is actually the railroad tracks. And just by virtue of the way it has been with redlining and, and other systemic issues, the, the Black population, at Black and Hispanic population is lower income and they live on one side of the tracks and the more affluent white population lives on the other side of the tracks, which is up the hill. So it's very, it's, obviously divided. And we thought that the age family program could really help bring the community together. Next slide, please. This is just a sample of one of the spreadsheets that we had. This was about improved access to information about services and programs. But we did a spreadsheet pretty much for each of the eight domains. I think we combined two of them, the one for social isolation and the one for civic participation. We combined those into one. But we had a very detailed spreadsheet of what we were going to do when we were going to do it, who was going to be our partner in it, and then what would be the results that we would hope to expect. And then we had to evaluate ourselves on that. Um, next slide, please. I don't expect you to read this, it's pretty detailed. Then we said about working our plan. Uh, as I said, it was a, a real public-private partnership. We worked closely with city officials and the elected officials and the offices in town. Uh, we even got the DPW uh, annual calendar that they put out to include little blurbs about age-friendly things like who you can call for home repairs, don't forget to help your neighbors with shoveling their snow and raking their leaves, just little things like that, that that really help inform the community about things that could be happening. We did a lot with communications, uh, using print communications, social media, and digital with website and various other things. We did workshops and conferences. We had workshops on balance, on Medicare, on end-of-life planning, and a number of other 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 sessions. We also did conferences, one on housing options, which is how to stay in your home and save money because you're not going to find a low income place to live. So how can you make where you live now better for you? So it's it's safer for you. So you can take advantage of the various resources that are available to you that will help you with your, keep your costs down and help your home stay safe. And then we did the same thing for transportation options. So people could learn from NJ Transit how to use public transportation and they could also access a thing called GoGo -Go Grandparent, where they can use a regular telephone, an analog phone, to use Uber and Lyft, and also getting familiar with the county transportation services that are available. We also did a walkability study. This was done through 
a state organization and they actually came and walked with a group of us around town to see where there needed to be changes. Better pedestrian signals, better crossing, stri striping at crosswalks, um, just better flow around town and also speed limits. There are a lot of things that we recommended to the city and Englewood has done a good job of changing some of them. It's difficult because probably like your town, a lot of state roads go through, uh, state roads and county roads go through our town. So we need to work with the state and with the county to, um, to make improvements possible. We also sponsored shows at Bergen Pack because we wanted people to realize that older people like to get out and have fun. And we wanted to make sure that older people were very visible out there having fun. There's a lot of ageism in our world and we wanted to make sure people valued older people as part of the community. Next slide, please. And then along came COVID and everything changed dramatically. Uh, next slide, please. But by virtue of the collaboration that we already had in place, we were able to morph very quickly to meet new and emerging needs. And you'll recall that immediately people needed information. There was so much, so much going on at the same time about where should you wear a mask? Is it airborne? Is it by finding things at the grocery store? Is it just, there was just so much need for information. There was also financial distress because people lost their jobs. Um, access to food was a huge issue, especially for older people who didn't want to get out, they were terrified of getting out and they couldn't get food. There was a real dearth of people who were able to do deliveries at that time. And at the same time, there was concern about isolation that people were in their homes. If they were older and did not know how to use a computer, they were totally isolated. If they didn't have a cell phone, it was just a real shame. So we did a lot of community outreach about that. We also provided access to technology through devices and Wi-Fi access and training. That became apparent, first of all, with the school system. We, a lot of kids, when they first let schools out, I know in the middle school, they said, now, do you have access to the internet? And the kids said, oh, yes, of course I do. Well, they meant they had access to their phone, but you can't really do school on your phone. They needed a device. So that was one thing our collaboration really worked on with the school system and with other people in town to get devices to people, whether they were students or older people who were isolated. Then when George Floyd was murdered, there was a huge interest in town around racial justice, and we formed a coalition for racial unity and equity that has many of the same partners that were in our collaboration. And around that same time, they were doing the census. So we were able to get word out through our various partners about the importance of the census and of voter registration so people could participate in those real civic duties. And then Tropical Storm Idaho in 2021, and our coalition also was able to ramp up for that and help people get what the help they needed that then for flood damage control, and also for getting food and for getting information about what they could, how, how to access FEMA and other resources in response to her, <clears throat> to Hurricane Ida. <clears throat> Pardon me. I had done a lot of that with Hurricane Sandy several years ago, so I was very familiar with how you go through that process. But our coalition was very helpful in getting people what they needed after that. Um, again, public-private partnership is what really worked in, in all of these situations. Next slide, please. Uh, that's a duplicate slide, you can go to the next. Um, our coalition was really a community collaboration. It was essential. We were meeting, meet, meeting, meeting, pardon me. We were meeting about monthly when we first started. And then we were meeting weekly when the pandemic hit. And now we're meeting about monthly. And we had calls with key leaders in town and organizations, including city leaders, nonprofits, houses of worship, as I mentioned. We're able to identify urgent needs right in town and we can brainstorm to meet those needs. Who has what? Can you get it to somebody else? And whatever, we, it was just a very collaborative um, organization structure. And we then would follow up and cycle back and repeat and we just keep doing that. Um, depends on what's going on in town, what, what are the urgent needs? What can we do to pitch in and help? And at the same time, we always have the aging population. I always have the aging population in mind as well as other people do too, and how we can meet the needs of the seniors in town while meeting the other needs of everyone in town. Next slide, please. Some examples of our broad-based communications. And digitally, we did e-newsletters, a website, social media, podcasts, and videos. Um, for the print directory, that the At Your Service is a directory of about 60 pages that we put together with information about county services from our area agency on aging which is the Burton County Division of Senior Services, plus services that are available directly in Englewood um, for our residents. And we did flyers and posters 
We use placement at the library, houses of worship, and resource kiosks around town. Um, the library is an essential resource in helping to get information out. And uh, as, as both a, a virtual partner, as well as a public place partner. And then we did a lot of events in person and online, educational programs, socials, dance party. We had lots of different dance parties and socials during the pandemic and now in person. Uh, next slide, please. The best practices that we have formed over the past several years are really the, the coalition that I mentioned, leading and participating in community collaborations, um, hosting and promoting community events, social activities, and the conferences and workshops that I mentioned and effective communications. The newsletter that I send out, I do, did it, well, when the pandemic hit, I started doing it daily because there was so much information that was coming out and people really wanted that information. So I did this, a newsletter that had links to other services so people didn't have to go to all the other websites to find the information. We had the link to the CDC, we had the link to the Burton County Department of Health, and we had links to various other places. 50 to 100 links in every newsletter so people could get the information they needed. And it continues to be opened. It's had about 160,000 open so far. No more, more like 180,000 now. We also did the directory of services, which was available in physical form, but also available online. People could peruse it online. And we had a website that is pretty interactive uh, where people could get a lot of information there as well. Um, on our website, we have a link, a page that's just links to everything under the sun that you can think of whether it's uh, physical disease information or information about transportation, information about accessing housing, about staying safe in your home. It's just called Helpful Links and that's on our website. Um, next slide, please. And for continuity of effort, we're working towards sustainability. Um, the community collaboration will be key in however we proceed in the future. Effective communications will be, will be important. Um, we also want to embed age-friendly policies and practices in all city departments and with the city manager. And we think it takes dedicated staff. I mean, all of the age-friendly communities that I know of do have someone whose job it is to manage the, the coalition and manage the activities. Um, as I mentioned, in Garfield, it was the public health nurse who was the dedicated staff person. In other communities, it was someone who was the head of a nonprofit who took on the formation of the coalition. And then they also fund a dedicated staff person to run the age-friendly initiative after the coalition was formed. But um, it's important to have an, an advisory council of your key partners in town, um, which then can morph out into the larger collaboration. Um, so that's really what I have to tell you about age-friendly Inglewood. And I, next slide, please. That's my information. It's at agefriendlyenglewood at gmail.com. And our website is age-friendlyenglewood.org. And my personal email is janet.sharma.44 at gmail.com. And you can feel, feel free to reach out to me. And me, I, and my colleagues will be happy to help you with other information if you want to get started in an age-friendly community yourself. Thank you. If we could go to the next slide and we'll turn it over to Stacy to give us some demographic details. All righty. Thank you, Janet, for giving us a nice example of what this looks like at the local level. And um, Mike, I'm going to try not to forget to tell you when to advance the slide. So just going to do my best there. Um, all righty. So thank you to all the attendees for your interest in age-friendly work. My name is Stacy Callahan. I've been with the uh, Department of Human Services Office of Research and Evaluation for about six years now. Uh, I'll be going over some basic statistics that my office has put together for this Lunch and Learn in order to better understand what our state looks like. Most of the data here uh, will be from the American Community Survey from the Census Bureau. Next slide. So here we have a map of the New Jersey population over 65 years old in New Jersey, broken down by county. Uh, if the, the screen uh, is blocking the map, you could just slide it over, it should work. Uh, this, is this map is courtesy of our department GIS guy, Chuck Holbert. The darkest shaded counties have the higher 65 plus population counts. 
So that's Bergen, Ocean, Middlesex, Essex, and Monmouth. These five counties plus Morris County account for half of New Jersey's 65 plus population. Bergen County is home to more than to more 65 plus residents than Cape May, Cumberland, Salem, Hunterdon, Warren, Sussex counties combined. Next slide. This map shows the share of 65 plus residents within each county. So of the total population, what percentage is 65 or older? As you can see, Cape May and Ocean have the highest percentages of older adults. Just over a quarter of Cape May's total population is 65 and older, and 22.4% of the residents in Ocean County are in the same age group. Essex and Hudson had the smallest shares of older adults. The statewide percentage was 15.9, just for something to compare it to. So 15.9 is the statewide for New Jersey. Uh, it's slightly above the national figure, which is 15.6. Next slide. So now we'll look at the growth of the older adult population over the last 10 years within each county. Northern suburban counties like Hunterdon and Sussex counties saw the greatest increase in their older adult population. Hunterdon saw a 50% increase while Sussex was close behind growing at over 48%. Those figures far outstripped the statewide growth of 27.5%. Ocean County had the smallest increase over the last 10 years, but as noted earlier in those maps, they had the second highest number of people aged 65 plus, and the county with the second highest share of their population being over 65. The growth rate of 16% down there at the bottom is still a sizable increase, and that's the, that's the county with the smallest growth. Just to give you an idea of how much uh, we've already expanded. Next slide. This slide shows the 20 year past trend of New Jersey population over 65 with a projection out to 2029. The number at the top of each bar shows the New Jersey population for that year. Under that figure is the share of population they make up. So that's 13.2, 13.2, 16.2, and 19.5. Those numbers at the bottom of the bar show increases compared to the prior bar. So the percentage increase in pretty much the last 10 years, both in the estimated number and the percentage increase in their share of the total population. So from 2020 to 2029, those two last bars to the right, New Jersey will gain more than 414 uh, 414,000 people, 65 and older, which is a 28.7% increase. Overall, you can see the number of older adults in New Jersey is predicted to grow, both in count and in the share of the total population. By 2029, it's projected that adults 65 and older will account for almost one in five adults, or New Jerseyans, I should say, which is 19, it's specifically 19.5% in 2029 is the projection. Next slide. Alrighty, this slide shows New Jersey's population pyramid based on the most current data and a projection to 2023. So 2020 is on the left, 2030 is on the right, and uh, that's a CDC wonder estimates. So each bar represents the percentage of the total population within a five year age group. Females in orange on the left and males in blue on the right. Ignore the negatives there on the left, just so that Excel uh, does what I say I want it to do. Um, what this is showing pretty much is the estimated distribution of our residents by age in 2020 and the projected distribution in 2030. In the 2020 pyramid on the left, you could clearly see the post-war baby boom bulge centered in the 55 to 59 year cohort. The echo boom bulge is about 20 years down the stack, centered on the 35 to 39 year cohort. In the 2030 pyramid, 
the baby boom bulge has ascended 10 years up the stack to be centered at about 65 to 69 cohort, illustrating the increasing share of older adults that dem demographers expect. Next slide. These population pyramids show the same thing, but instead of percentages, this one's looking at estimated numbers. You could really see the increases when you look at each bar in relation to the grid lines. If you look at the males in 2020 on the left, the third bar from the top, which is 75 to 79 years old, is reaching just over the grid line at almost 116,000. And on the right, the 2030 graph, graph, the same bar jumps to halfway to the next grid line, which is over 154,000. Same thing when looking at eight females, 85 plus, which is the topmost bar. It goes from 157,000 on the left to almost 200,000 by 2030. Next slide. Alrighty, so we looked at some projections by the, uh, we looked at how much growth we've seen. Now let's look at the projected growth by county. So from 2019 to 2029, uh, Somerset, Middlesex, and Sussex counties are projected to see their share of the largest increase of older adults. Somerset County 65 plus population will increase by 54%, Middlesex by 47, and Sussex by almost 43%. While the increases in Cape May and Ocean are still sizable, they will see the smallest increase. Like I've said before, Ocean County already has a very high density and number of older adults. Even then, they'll still see an over 20% increase to, uh, from 2019 to 2029. The same can be said with Cape May. They already have a pretty high density of older adults in the county. 25.8% of the total population is older adults. Statewide, we'll see almost 32% increase in older adults over 10 years. This equates to about 446,900 people. Uh, next slide. Now we'll look at some characteristics of the older adult population. Here we're showing household income by county. Again, thanks to Chuck for the map. Just have to do the shout out there. The darker green, the darker the green is, the higher the income. The New Jersey household median income of those 65 plus in 2019 was almost 60,000. Hunterdon, Morris, Somerset, and Bergen had the highest incomes. Every county in New Jersey except Cumberland and Hudson had a median household income higher than the U.S. household income of almost 49,000. Next slide. We do have some data available from the American Community Survey on social isolation, which uh, Janet spoke about um, that being uh, an identified need in the, her community. On this slide, we're looking at people in New Jersey who live alone and are 65 and older. The 2021 five-year estimate found that there were about 387,000 residents in New Jersey that fit this criterion. That's 42.8% of the households with a head 65 years or older. Hudson and Essex had the highest share of older adults living alone. Hunterdon and Sussex had the lowest share. This is an objective measure of social isolation, but not necessarily subjective isolation. A person could live alone and be very well connected to their community and not isolated. But it does give you a sense of what your community looks like. Next slide. Uh, so this graphic shows the percentage of older adults by county who speak a language other than English at home and who also rate their ability to speak English less than very well. Hudson had the largest share of their population meeting this definition at 42.2%. That figure was well above the statewide rate of 14.3. That's there in the, in the figure and you could see the US there as well. Next slide. Normally, I would show you language spoken by county next, 
but there's a few reasons why I can't do that for you. Sorry I had to bore you with the reason why. I'll try to be quick, but linguists recognize over 7,000 language and the ACS codes over 1,000 of these languages. Due to confidentiality, the 1,000 languages are aggregated into larger categories. Uh, drilling down to the county level and adding a specific age group like 65 plus, uh, especially with less populated counties, tends to yield very low figures with high margins of error. Next slide. So since I can't show you the county breakdowns with language, here's a regional language spoken, which comes from an analysis done by the New American Economy using the 2018 ACS data. You could see here that Spanish was the top language access need across New Jersey for all regions, but there are some notable differences when comparing regions. North Jersey has Korean and Polish language access needs. Central Jersey has Gujarati and English language, uh, Chinese language access needs, and South Jersey has Chinese and Vietnamese coming in second and third. Next slide. This is a quick statewide uh, tabulation of the language spoken um, for 65 plus at the statewide level. So the top language spoken, no surprises here, Spanish followed by Chinese. And that includes a variety of, of specific languages under that category. Next slide. All right, next we're gonna take a look at housing cost burden for residents 65 and older by county. This is a huge topic uh, for age-friendly initiatives. There's uh, quite a lot going on in this graph, so let's break it down. Housing cost burden is defined by household or individuals spending more than 30% of their income on housing. The green bars are the percentage of individuals spending more than 30% of their income on housing for renters. So green bar, renters. Blue bars is the percentage of housing cost burden for homeowners. In all cases, the green bar or the renter housing cost burden is higher than the blue bar, which is housing cost burden for homeowners. Clearly, homeowners are in better shape financially. Mercer and Passaic counties have the highest cost burden for renters. Even though Mercer has the highest prevalence of housing cost burden, they have the lowest housing cost burden in the state for homeowners. That the frequency, so we're looking at that top bar, 32% and 61%, that's double the housing cost burden in Mercer County for renters. The highest uh, housing cost burden for homeowners is in Hudson County with 45% of their individuals 65 and older paying 30% or more of their income on housing. So with that being said, where does your county stand? and what needs to be done uh, to reduce these rates. Next slide. So we're gonna close this presentation out with voting. We know that older adults have some of the highest voter turnout. New Jersey has almost 1.5 million eligible voters, 65 and older in 2021. Again, that is 1.5 million eligible voters, 65 and older in New Jersey. They account for over 23% of all eligible voters. Bergen, Ocean, and Middlesex counties have the highest numbers of eligible voters, 65 plus. These numbers will continue to grow over time, and this supports the importance of any efforts serving your town by making New Jersey more age-friendly to our older adults and people of all ages. Next slide. So that is it for today. Thanks for listening in and thanks to Mike for advancing the slides. I hope I made a strong case as to why this work is desperately needed. And with the other information presented, hopefully we planted some slates, some seeds and some ideas. Um, I believe I will talk about the, uh, the survey monkey link. Um, I will put that in the, I think, I think we do have some time for questions, um, but I, I'm going to put a, a link in the chat to our SurveyMonkey um, 
if you if you attended today, regardless of your interest, like you really, really want to do this or you're not so sure, we would it doesn't matter what category you fall in, we'd be really interested just to hear sort of your gauge your interest and to see sort of what the challenges and um, uh, the barriers might be and what might needed um, what might be needed to um, execute some of this work. So we'll send that in the chat. And I guess um, we don't have a whole lot of time for questions. So I will let Mike, um, I'll hand it over to Mike and- uh, Sure, thank you, thank you, Stacy. Appreciate, appreciate it. The, uh, the link uh, is also on the slide. And if you can put it, if it's not in the chat box yet, as well. Uh, thank you all for, for coming today. And um, if some, we have a little background noise. Uh, so Paul Pena, our, our, Paul Pena, our senior legislative analyst, has been uh, monitoring the chat box. But if anyone has any questions, you can drop them in the chat box. Uh, or can throw it. Paul, uh, I can't really see the box from here. So if you, uh, have we got any questions yet? So, Mike, uh, do, please go ahead and ask your questions in the chat box um, while we're waiting for that. One question I did have, Janet, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about planning grants. Can you identify the source of those funds and the application process? The source for us was the Henry and Maryland Job Foundation. I think, which is a foundation that um, Henry Taub was a founder of ABP. Uh, and they provide funding locally in Bergen and Passaic counties. But what I think one of the things that the Age Friendly Advisory Council really wants the state to do, and I think it may even be in the governor's budget, is to provide grants to communities to start an age friendly process. I wonder if that person could be muted. Uh, can everyone mute themselves, please? Yeah, if you're not speaking, you can make background noise. Can the host mute everybody? I'll handle it. <laughs> yeah. One moment. Okay. Here. Oh my God. I know. Anyway, our, our grant was specific to the community. But Janet, I, I did mute everyone, so you have to unmute yourself now. Okay. Uh, yeah. Our grant was specifically for uh, the Traub Foundation was funding organizations. Uh, exclusively in Bergen County. Um, and there was another foundation, the Grotta Fund, which was out of the uh, Metro West Jewish Federation, and they were funding organizations in some other parts of the state. But again, as I was saying, one of the initiatives that we would really like to be in the governor's budget is grants to communities to start age-friendly processes. And uh, the age-friendly communities that are already in existence are going to be setting up some sort of a mentoring process to help those of you want to start your own age-friendly initiative. Um, and we would want there to be in the budget something that would help fund a mentoring program as well. Yeah, um, so as Janet referenced, um, there is a uh, language uh, in the proposed budget, uh, in the pro governor's proposed budget, um, to provide grants to communities um, that are interested in starting the age-friendly process. So um, while we can't guarantee it, it is in the proposed budget. And so any support behind that would help us to make that come true. Um, I did put also, Adam dropped the um, link to the survey monkey in the chat um, for everyone, but I also did um, drop in our um, age-friendly inbox um, for everybody. So if you wanted to email to that email address um, any specific comments or questions about the age-friendly process or about the advisory council, we'd be happy to do that. Um, and as Janet mentioned, there is a um, large um, network in the Northern Jersey uh, area of, for um, the uh, communities to come together and support each other. And they are talking about mentorship opportunities. So you could reach out to Janet directly. She has her email in there, um, but we'd also be happy to field those and send them to that group if you had any interest in, in mentorship. So I know well, we're at time, is, so I'll. <laughs> there, there is an age-friendly North Jersey Alliance. Mm -hmm. We do have a newsletter. So if you want to get that newsletter, just send me an email. I have my email in the chat. Thank you very much, Mike. That uh, that's everything from the uh, the meeting chat. All right, um, and they did also drop. Yeah, as you can tell, they dropped in a link to the survey to the survey uh, to where questions can go and 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 um, 
uh, John's contact information. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, w one quick question. I've, I've, uh, through the years, I've heard mayors and local officials talk about, you know, in addressing their affordable housing obligations, trying to reach out to, to, to the, the older population who have lived in the community for, for years and now might be priced out of, of their own home because, uh, because as, as kids move on. Uh, what's a good way for, for, for a community that, that might be in a settlement and, and, and you, you're trying to achieve their housing obligation to also address this need? Is there any, any suggestions or tips you can offer? I wish I had some. That's one of the most critical needs everywhere across, across the country. It's a critical need everywhere. There just is not enough affordable housing. And seniors are living in their homes and their homes are falling down around them. And their homes are not safe, but they can't afford to move anywhere. My, uh, my own home has stairs everywhere. You know, it's not a big house, but there's stairs everywhere. And if we get disabled, it'll be a real problem. Fortunately, we'd probably be able to move someplace, but a lot of people can't. And despite this, the, the slide that Stacy was showing about income and how Bergen is the wealthiest, one of the wealthiest counties, that's true, but it's also got a huge population that's low income that's factored in. Yes, they're, they're very wealthy people, but they're also a lot of very poor people. And especially in Englewood, it's definitely got a lot of people who are cost burden and there are no options. There are just no options for housing. Bergen County does have as part of its area agency on aging, the division of senior services, uh, a housing navigator who puts together all the information from the 70 towns in Bergen County and what are their, what are their wait lists that are opening up or who's building a new building that may have some affordable options in it. Um, so that's a good community resource, but there's nowhere near, nowhere on any drawing board is there anywhere near a plan to meet the need. All right, well, maybe that's the discussion for a lunch and learn some day down the road. I want to figure out some solutions, but uh, all right. So uh, seeing no more further questions, I'll wrap this up. I'd like to thank, thank the three of you for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, this is being recorded and will be available for viewing later online on our website. Uh, if we can get the PDF, we'll share that as well. Uh, the PDF of the, of, the, of the slide deck, we will share that as well. Um, you have the contact information for further questions and um, hope to keep the dialogue and engagement going on uh, going forward. So thank you all. And uh, uh, it seems like we might actually have uh, the beginning of a spring. So maybe everyone should step outside and get some fresh air and enjoy spring but, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.